Bill, you were a student of Martin Diamond. He, he was such a great student of the American founding, as we'll discuss. But how did you become a student? I'm just curious. I started with Martin Diamond when he first came to Northern Illinois University. He had just left Claremont Men's College um, and came to NIU, and I joined him there uh, as his first graduate uh, assistant. I had been at Michigan State uh, previously for the, for the four years for my undergraduate education, and I had become somewhat friendly with a, a, the dean of Madison, called James Madison College, a residential college at Michigan State, uh, which had just gotten underway. Of course, it's had an illustrious career and still around. Uh, right. But uh, Herbert. So this is the early 70s? This is, this is, yeah, this is, this is the late 60s. Um, I left uh, James Madison in 71. Uh, Herb Garfinkel, the dean, realized that I was, uh, I was a, a leftist, but I was salvageable. Uh, <laughs> I, had, I had been easily outflanked by my more radical colleagues uh, and was sort of left high and dry politically. But he, he understood that uh, possibly there was something worth... Uh, uh, digging out of this, uh, uh, you know, brokenness. So he he sent me along to Martin Diamond at, at Northern Illinois, as I say, where he was just beginning to teach. So that was how. So you show up how. as a first year grad student. I show up, and as you a, knew of Diamond. Uh, um, that's one reason you had gone there, I suppose. Well, I was supposed to have read a lot of Diamond before I went, but like a lot of undergraduates, uh, I didn't read the things I was supposed to read. So it was something of a surprise uh, to discover to discover him. Uh, he was, especially for someone who is coming out of a, a kind of a quasi left-wing background, he was ideal because he himself, as a young man, had been a socialist and a serious socialist, not just a, a hanger-on. But he had, uh, as a very young person, he and Herb Garfinkel and another prominent uh, scholar, Philip Selznick, had been sort of street cor corner orators in New York City uh, uh, talking about socialism to the masses and so forth. Garfinkel had this big booming voice. He would draw the crowds in, and then Diamond and Selznick would work the dialectic uh, <laughs> with, with, with the crowd. Um, but Diamond was had been a serious socialist. Yeah, I'd forgotten that part of, about him. Yeah, he had been a member of the Central Committee of the Socialist Party. He had been very close to Norman Thomas, actually, who had been a presidential candidate uh, for the, the American Socialist Party several times. So he was quite serious and and uh, a socialist. And he had changed his mind. Um, and so what we got when we began studying with Martin Diamond was a person who had at one point been very seriously skeptical of the American regime, of the American political order, and had come now to accept it uh, in, uh, in a very deep and, and loving way. But his, his take on the American regime was very realistic. It never, he, he didn't uh, worship the regime in the way that uh, unfortunately too many of our uh, friends today, conservative friends, seem to, uh, um, you know, glorify and uh, uh, cleanse the image of the American political order. Diamond had no such compunctions. He was, he, he saw the flaws, the weaknesses, uh, the defects of the regime, as well as its strengths. And so when you studied the American political order with him, you learned about a political order that was founded on some fairly uh, base and not terribly admirable political impulses, the impulses of self-interest and ambition. Uh, Diamond uh, taught, uh, how, it taught us how impulse, uh, those impulses of self-interest and ambition, uh, this, the proper structuring of those common human uh, passions available to everyone, by properly structuring those passions and interests and ambitions, you could erect a decent democratic regime. Um, and he introduced you to the excitement of, <laughs> for the first time, um, this, this notion that for the first time in human history, uh, democracy had been made safe for mankind. Um, his, in his studying and, and teaching of the, of the founders and the Federalist Papers, I think people underestimate just how much he 
brought back, you know, now it's sort of okay to like the Federalist Papers and there are biographies written about Madison and Hamilton and their founders are appealed to all the time, right. certainly by conservatives at least. But yeah. that was not the case when he began his work in, I guess, late 50s, early mid 60s and, and into the 70s when, when you met him. No, I mean, that's... I think we really underestimate how much of an impact he had, don't you think? I, Absolutely. I think it's uh, it's a a serious uh, underestimation, and it's one that I, you know, I trust that our efforts here today will, right. will help <laughs> rectify. But uh, you're right. It's it's we, we forget, for instance, that uh, Federalist Ten, Federalist Papers Number Ten, which of course is now read in every um, introductory American government class across country. Um, it, the Federalist Papers as a whole were almost never read. Uh, Federalist 10 would be reproduced in, in various uh, readers about American political thought because it was thought to illustrate Madison's cold-blooded, uh, realistic, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, approach to American politics. Interest group politics. Interest group right. politics. Right. This is the he was a precursor of modern political e science. Exactly. So. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but Diamond uh, was really the first person to remind us that there is a larger teaching in the Federalist uh, papers. Uh, he, <laughs> my first graduate course at Northern Illinois, uh, he, we actually worked our way through Max Farron's uh, records of the Federal Convention of 1787. Now that was something that was absolutely never done right at the time. I mean, this was a, 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 a very obscure uh, a source. If, if you ever looked at the Federal Convention, you read Madison's notes, but Farrand had Madison's notes and all these other accounts of the Federal Convention. I'd forgotten until I read your father's uh, uh, eulogy uh, after Martin Diamond died, and I, you know, you're, they were childhood Very friends as well, yeah. boyhood friends. I'd forgotten that Diamond's first aspiration was to be an actor. Uh, or possibly a director. He admired uh, uh, Eisenstein, the famous Russian director. That was so. He had a dramatic flair, as as anyone who knew him would tell you. He was first of all a teacher, um, and he he wanted to leave his students walking on air when they left his class. And I can tell you that that really he he really did uh, uh, achieve that. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about that before we get back to the substance. I mean, he was yeah. so famously. A good teacher. This was many decades ago, but I, I think right. he may have been on the cover of yeah, Time in, magazine. In, Is that in not 19, right? In 1966, he was. They they did a cover story, the ten best college teachers in America, and uh, there he was on the cover of Time magazine as one of the ten best, uh, holding his bicycle on the campus of <laughs> Claremont Men's College. So yeah, he was he was a, a wonderful. Uh, engaging uh, teacher. Uh, he is, again, your, to quote your father's eulogy, uh, he felt a, responsi a, a responsibility never to be boring. Uh, and that, that's absolutely true. He was, he was determined to engage uh, in spirit, to provoke uh, reflection in, among his students. And he really achieved that by uh, walking, as I say, the first class, walking us through, uh, uh, you know, the day-by-day -day account of the Federal Convention of 1787. So it was like a, working our way through a script, a movie script, right. if you will, you know. And this was a seminar, I suppose. This, not was, a, this yeah. was a seminar, exactly. And, and unlike a lot of courses uh, taught by students of Leo Strauss, we actually made it, you know, <laughs> a substantial way Is that through, right? the, That's good. Through, <laughs> through the volumes. Uh, but but uh, yeah, his his uh, what he taught was that uh, you know the the he he of all the students of of Leo Strauss was unafraid to embrace and to celebrate the modern characteristics of the American regime. That is to say, uh, on the basis of readily attainable human impulses and passions, you could found a regime. Right, using institutional arrangements, you could uh, cr stimulate the interplay of human interests and passions in such a way that you would have a stable, moderate, and decent democracy. And you can trace this through the entire uh, structure, the institutional structure of the American government. You can trace it through American society. Uh, Diamond was one of the first to, to really discuss the political importance of the large commercial republic, a, commer a, a republic that was divided into countless economic interest groups 
and our politics, therefore, would be, uh, as I say, low. You know, it would not be a, an elevated politics, but it would be characterized by this constant buzz and confusion of, of interest groups jockeying for political position. Uh, and as majorities form out of this jockeying, they would be majorities that, that were quite stable and moderate in their policies and in their outlook. And that same impulse could be traced through the, the, uh, the institutional infrastructure of American government. It's, it's there in the, the, uh, the House of Representatives, you know, the district system and so forth. But all of that was designed to, to stimulate these, uh, these uh, human passions and harness them uh, to the, the establishment of a decent democratic regime, something absolutely new and different in American history, uh, in, in, in the history of the world. Um, so that was a, that was a critical thing uh, that he introduced us to, and unlike some of his colleagues, he, as I say, he was not afraid to embrace that low but solid foundation. And he learned uh, from, I think in the spirit of Strauss here too, he learned from the founders. He was. He took Madison and Hamilton seriously. Right. He didn't assume they were some earlier stage of political science that we had Correct. gone beyond, which we, right. which one forgets was so dominant in, in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Even the people who sort of liked them and respected them, there was a kind of condescending attitude right. towards them. Yeah. Yeah, the political science prior to this rediscovery of the founding uh, really was, was all about uh, behavioral, you know, studies of behavioral, uh, the behavior, political behavior uh, in the, uh, within the American political order because, and, and as Diamond pointed out, as a result, political science sort of lost its subject matter to any number of other disciplines. Uh, political science became psychology or sociology. It was always in search of the underlying, uh, um, you know, emotional impulses that would that or economics would economics Marxists, exactly yeah. yeah economics determining american politics so the founding the founders american political thought itself was very much a debased uh a study when when diamond and his colleagues and you know the, this is it's important to point out that diamond was part of a wave of of scholars coming into American political thought at the time, Herbert Storing, uh, Walter Burns, the late Walter Burns, or, uh, uh, Harry Jaffa, and so forth, Robert Goldwyn. Uh, these men basically restored a respectful understanding of the Founders Project to our view. It was, as you say, prior to that time, uh, the founders were either irrelevant or they were obvious tools of the plutocratic uh, oppressors of the masses and so forth. Uh, they were not worthy of serious study. Uh, and Diamond pointed out, and it's true, that, you know, people didn't, as you say, people didn't read the Federalist Papers. Right. I mean, now, as you say, it's, it's in every introductory American government. Of course you read at well, least. Be. I'm not sure it is, but at well, least people it, 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 vaguely it, sense right. it could be maybe. Right. Yeah. Yes. So. Uh, but no, you're right. That, but I think back then it was snippets of Federalist 10, yeah, maybe Federalist 51, right, yeah. and that was it, sort of. And it was all in the in the course of proving how bad the founders were. This is, right. you know, or at best, a precursor to you know 1950s and 60s political science. Exactly. Right? I mean, right. not not taken seriously in their own. Right. Yeah. Did you read the Federalist Papers with with Diamond? Absolutely. I mean, yes. Yes. I, we worked our way one one course worked our way through, as I say, the records of the Federal Convention. Uh, another course, the Federalist, uh, a couple of uh, a course on Aristotle's ethics and oh. Aristotle's politics. But he didn't write about that. Interestingly enough, he I have his copy of the of the ethics, and it's you know Scotch taped together and massively underlined, and and obviously has been read many times. Uh, but he never he never wrote about that uh, explicitly. He did have he did have many references to classical political thought in his writing. Um, he was, it, it, while he was celebrating the American regime, it was clear that one of the reasons that the regime was, was so worth defending and worth understanding is that even on that low but solid foundation that we've been talking about, uh, higher levels of excellence are possible. Uh, you know, he talks about uh, Alexis de Tocqueville and uh, decentralism and t townships, 
private associations, the importance of decentralized institutions for raising people out of mere uh, individualism, mere self-absorption, and getting them interested in self-government, government more, you know, more broadly. In other words, becoming interested in running their own lives, looking toward some understanding of justice, uh, forming opinions about, about higher things. That's all part of the process of ascending from the low but solid foundation of the American regime. Various components of the, of the uh, institutional order are designed to draw out um, deeper, deeper impulses of, of uh, political understanding, uh, deeper uh, dimensions of political understanding. Uh, and, and it culminates in, in, a, in a free regime where the study of politics is permitted and encouraged. You know, yeah. he stands at the pinnacle. He, Diamond, understood that this was, for all its low but solid foundation, this was the place where the study of politics could proceed, w including the study of ancient political philosophy. I mean, he, he was always cognizant of the fact that this is the political order that allowed his teacher, Leo Strauss, right, to come here from from the from a terrible situation in Europe, and proceed to study and to teach others about classical political theory as well as modern political theory. So, all, and, and Diamond's political science uh, itself, he was he he was very Aristotelian in the sense that in his teaching, and he cared very deep. He he not only was a good teacher. But he cared deeply about teaching, and he wrote right. about teaching. He wrote quite a bit about it. He was, he was very uh, concerned that teachers in his time, and it applies as well to teachers today, seemed to relish the debunking attitude toward the American political order or uh, toward any decent impulses right. that kids bring to class, right? Uh, following Aristotle, following classical political thought, he thought it was very important First, to begin with kids where they are, begin with the opinions that are brought into the class, and then to leave those opinions intact, uh, elevate them as, as much as you can, uh, improve the opinions, uh, but always being aware that only a few of the kids in the class are going to be drawn into a deeper understanding of the American political order in its modernity or into a deeper understanding of, of political science most broadly. Uh, and, you know, his intention was to draw those kids up, but to leave intact, right, the decent opinions of those other kids that he taught. In other words, no easy, cynical debunking, you know, no trashing of, right. of the bourgeois values that, that kids bring into the classroom. Which is the easy way to be a popular, exactly. uh, t successful right. teacher. Right. And, and exactly. what's amazing is... Yeah, he was uh, such an exciting teacher. I mean, I was never really a student of his, but of course I knew him some as my, such a close friend of my parents. And uh, he had a very unusual combination, it seemed to me. My father, I think, once said this just privately to me. He was fl somewhat flamboyant. Yeah. And he did yeah. that. He took that from the movies and his appreciation of the importance of, of being captivating, I think, as a teacher. Um, but very modest. It's just sort of an unusual combination. I think deep down, very modest. I remember once asking him, uh, when I'd begun studying political philosophy, why didn't he write about mm -hmm. Aristotle and all these mm -hmm. Greeks who had such a deep influence on him through Strauss, but he read them and taught them himself, and right. he made some self-deprecating comment about, well, I leave that to the better students right. of Strauss. And I don't really know that that was right. true, that they were yeah. better, but they were, he really uh, felt, I think he had a lot to contribute in terms of writing about the founding, and others would take care of some of these other Issues and Strauss himself had taken care of a lot of it, I suppose. But right. um, yeah. he, uh, but he, d he didn't. He didn't write easily. Is that I, that's my memory? That he that's didn't write correct. that much. That's I mean, right. um, no, he didn't write that much, and and that's why this project is such a valuable one because it it brings uh, the uh, the handful of his writings together in one place and makes them available, readily available. And the writings are furthermore in some fairly obscure, you know, the public interest in being probably the most famous journal. That right. He wrote for all, I guess he did have one article in the American Political Science Review. But other than that, they were really in some very obscure journals and some political science newsletters and so forth. So, uh, But he devoted, it's my vague impression, my memory, he devoted a lot of work to 
each one. He was not a he, casu- was, he was a careful writer in that. Uh, you know, he he was had he, high standards for himself, maybe too high. But well, yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Probably too high. He was probably too demanding of of himself, and that did in fact keep him back from ever. Uh, ever writing a full-length book on the founding. He and Garfinkel, uh, Dean Garfinkel, and Winston Mills Fisk did write together a textbook called The Democratic Republic. Uh, and the first three or four chapters of that are, were Diamond's chapters, and they're still quite valuable. They're, they're still uh, very, very relevant to this. But yes, he found it difficult to write. Um, he once said to me privately that he regretted n- he regretted not spending more time in the sort of theoretical speculations and that he had spent so much of his time sort of looking at the everydayness of American politics and trying to make sense of it, not not the, the, uh, the specifics of political strategy, but trying to understand the American political order in all its uh, uh, ordinariness, you know, if if you will, and that's that was his primary project, trying to trying to look with clear eyes at the American political order, seeing that it was that it has a certain amount of of um, less than attractive qualities to it, i.e., a reliance on self interest and ambition, uh, and. And you know, being able to look at that, and yet at the same time say yes, but on the basis of this low but solid foundation, we're building these these higher, uh, right. more elevated uh, uh, positions that from which people can can study politics in its fullness. I mean, that that really was the his genius. And as I say, uh, of his he he. One of the things that always worried him a bit was when he would introduce students to classical political theory, right? Uh, you, you can imagine, you know, you're reading about Aristotle and, you know, Plato. You're, you're reading their writings and you discover this, this polis thing, right? This is <laughs> right. elevated republic devoted to this elevated uh, political order devoted to inculcation and encouragement of excellence in some form or another, which, of course, always sounds like us. Uh, and Diamond was always concerned that as, as you were introducing kids to this, this uh, you know, classical political order, that they didn't have contempt. They didn't come to have contempt for the American political order. He was always determined to remind, remind these kids, right, that that classical political, that classical political thought, as noble as it was and as elevated as it was, in fact, in practice, had disastrous results, right? Uh, and you know, is certainly the polit- the religious wars of of uh, the the time preceding the rise of modernity. Um, those were that was clear evidence, right? That classical political practice uh, didn't live up to the theory, and so the the uh, moderate virtues of the American political order have to be judged, you know, in that in that light. Uh, curiously, it's 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 interesting. We we forget how how um, revolutionary modernity is, and how you know horrible the times were right. uh, that that were left behind. Diamond, I remember, toward the end of his career, was reading about the Inquisition. <laughs> it, was, it was his evening reading. He was reading a book on the Inquisition to sort of remind himself of you know yeah for all the. Yes, yes, modernity, is, it, modernity has these problems, but it isn't the Inquisition. Right, <laughs> yeah. that's a good, uh, and, and, good reminder. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And um, Jean, I was, a couple of years before her death, I was talking to Jean Kirkpatrick about this, because she was also very close to yes. Martin Diamond, good friends, uh, and had learned a lot from him. Uh, but we were sort of lamenting that he wasn't around to... to uh, to educate us in these current times because, of course, now we have the rise of regimes built on religious intolerance that are very much like the regimes that modernity reacted against in the first place. And now we begin to see again uh, in everyday events, we we see the horror of what, uh, uh, you know, theological inspiration can lead, you know, people uh, uh, into. So, so, uh, you know, always, always the perspective uh, of of the past was important to Diamond, and the fact that modernity was in fact a significant 
improvement over what came before in practice, if not in theory. No, that's important. Any particular reading of his you'd recommend uh, to start with or to reread? Uh, or to yes, right. Uh, well, there's, a, there's an essay called Ethics and Politics, the American Way oh, that, that appeared initially uh, in a book edited by uh, Robert Horwitz entitled The Moral Foundations of the American Republic, but available, of course, on this wonderful new website. Um, and Though the book itself must be out of print for. Oh, I'm sure it is. Uh, it should be reprinted. I it, remember, as I remember, yeah. when I first taught American political thought yeah. at Penn, my first job, I remember signing that essay by Diamond yeah. and several other essays in that book. Oh, it was a good. It was which a great, is a great book. Yeah, it was a great collection. Uh, it's very true. But that essay will give you a sense of of uh, the full span of his teaching. It takes you from uh, the sort of the the modern foundations up to the possibilities. Of, uh, of you know that liberal education uh, open to students within this free regime, so it, it gives you a kind of a, an outline of his teaching, if you will. And in fact, the book of, of essays of Mr. Diamonds that I edited was really based on that. That that's the culminate. That's the final chapter in this edited volume, uh, and it was the the source of inspiration for the organization of, of the book as a whole. No, that's great. Well, he was a source of inspiration for many of us, and for you were, it was a great privilege, really, for you to be a student. He, he died much too young, obviously, but right. it's great to be able to keep him alive a little bit in this conversation or have him come back to mind in, in our case, and hopefully for others out there, a chance to introduce him to, to them and, and, and his work, which remains awfully important and uh, awfully instructive, I think, about America and about things beyond America. So, Bill, thanks so much for, for, for joining us today. Thank you for having me.